Hey guys, Coach Keeney here with Cam, and we have a special guest tonight, Austin Deleuze, whom I will introduce here in a minute. Today's topic is on nerves. Everybody gets nervous, especially before tryouts or big games. And we brought a guy in that has decades of experience, both as a college player and a pro player and playing collegiately at the highest level, went to the national championship in uh, in Austin, I think in 2007, 2008? 2007. 2007, yeah. he won the uh, national championship. He was captain in, uh, Austin, you're a captain in 2008? 2009. 2009. All right. I'm getting it all right today. So you won the, you were, a, you were a uh, four year, four years at uh, Wake Forest. Uh, yep. You were a captain in 2009, won the championship in 2007. And uh, before we start here, I want to ask you, I, I heard a little bit of a rumor when you were on the, uh, when you were on the way to winning the championship in the quarterfinals, you played against Notre Dame and you had the game winning goal. Tell me about that goal. Oh man. I wish I remembered it. Um, I think I just blacked out, but, uh, no, it was, it was a special moment for me is one that I'll never forget. Um, you know, it's sudden death over time. Uh, we, we had really dominated the entire game and Notre Dame had sort of hung on and hung on and, uh, came in off the bench and, and found myself at the top of the box, got a really good ball at the top of the box, uh, took one touch and tucked it into the lower left corner and, ripped my shirt off and, and ran into the stands. <laughs> so that's the part that I wanted to hear. So I, there was a uh, Wake Forest grad who's, and I can't remember his name, but his, his daughter trains with us. He said, ask Austin this question. So I looked online. I looked online. And here's the funny part. I looked online. I'm looking for those pictures. Uh, and there's a bunch of pictures out there. But you have to answer all these questions for how much you're willing to pay for these pictures. Mm. So I said, well, I'm only going to use it once. I'm going to use it a webcast. And, I'm gonna, <laughs> and it said 75 bucks. I said, all right. I, I'm going to have all, I'm going to have the real guy tell the story. So obviously, guys, this is Austin Deleuze, uh, uh, Wake Forest, uh, former Wake Forest captain, national champion, and, um, uh, and now a pro player at NCFC. And he has trained with us, been a trainer with us at some of our events and uh, just a also just a great human being, just a great uh, person. He's a teacher too. you're an English teacher right now. So you're du du doubling up as a um, as a professional player and you're also teaching English at a soccer academy isn't that right yeah t teaching might be a little generous I mostly just hang out and distract the kids um, <laughs> uh, you perfect. love the part though the glasses <laughs> yeah yeah that's why I started wearing them just so the kids would take me seriously <laughs> so um, there's there's actually one other thing uh, there's one other rumor that I wanted to uh, to dispel here or share um, so what is this about? What is this about? I don't know. Some somebody made that back uh, back when I played for the Red Bulls back in uh, 2010, and yeah. for for some reason it's still still hanging around. I guess when people say you can't erase things off the internet, they they ain't lying. They are right. Yeah. So we're gonna we're not gonna tell the people who this person is. So the first pers first person, the first player who guesses <laughs> who is the person that they are comparing to Austin. We'll give them a shout out. And by the way, for shout outs, we want to give a shout out to the Baltimore Celtic group. Uh, we have eight teams training in our um, team based training program. We also have four new teams. These are this is pretty, pretty special stuff. This is these are teams that are made up of players across the country. So they're anywhere from 14 to 16 players per training group. And that is Team Argentina, which Cam is managing Team uh, Germany, which Doug Oppenheimer and Susan Nichols is managing, and then uh, Team Delta, which Millicent Mills and Stella Hung are managing, and then the last one is Team uh, blah, 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 USA. I should admit, uh, Maria's Hoorah. looking at Maria's Hoorah. Maria's looking at me. <laughs> team USA, which is uh, Maria Keating, my lovely wife, is managing. So those kids are all really working hard to get better in a training on a training platform that we have that they can compete against each other and against other teams. Okay, so. Let's get on with this topic here. The first, the first is we're going to. Um, I think Austin wants to make a comment. Oh yeah, Austin, you had a, you had something. You had a. Uh, I'm excited. You had no, a. We were, we were just chatting before we, we went live about your. Uh, you were very particular about your instructions about my setup and how I should keep it very non-cluttered. And then we we go live here, and I don't know what's going on behind <laughs> you, but. <laughs> you don't. What do you, what do you say? You don't. 
this, this is hey, this you're you're being very personal here. My my father built this. He spent it's character building. It's, 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 it's lets it's, the people know what kind of person you are. That, those are my dad's words, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. this is yeah, he's so right. I am uh I I and that's then so Austin's right. Nice lovely background. You know what he did? He spent all day, guys, just to be clear. Cleaning. Austin spent all day taking posters off the wall. I cleared this whole room out. Yeah, he had, he had, uh, you can see his bike has been put into the uh, off, <laughs> off lens so far off camera. So I appreciate you commenting on that. But I, you know what? As soon as I read, wrote those and, and sent them to you, I said, you know, he's going to say something about my <laughs> office. You know me too well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So those of you that have not, uh, over Cam's head here is a knight. That's a, a costume that I wore in Switzerland at a wedding. So I won't get into the story there, but I'll, sometime I'll tell you about that. <laughs> all right, so let's get on to our um, let's get on to our uh, topic. So first of all, guys, we want you to ask questions. Austin just has got great amount of experience, very funny, very interesting guy. So take advantage of it and ask him questions. And if it's not exactly on topic, that's okay. We'll address those questions too. So the topic today we're covering is nerves. How do you perform? How do you make sure that you perform well? in tryouts or big games. And I wanna divide these answers up into two chunks. The first chunk is for the untrained, okay? So if you're not trained or you're not prepared, there is one path to take. We're not gonna talk about that path until the end of this, this discussion. We're gonna talk about the, the path that you have trained, that you've been training hard and you've been working hard. And we're gonna give you five ideas, okay? First idea that which we're gonna give you guys is on, um, is on mistakes. All right, so a lot of people will hold themselves back because they're worried about making mistakes. And what I wanna do is share with you here. You're gonna hear something here. I'm gonna switch over here and share with you guys a, um, a video uh, on mistakes right here. It should be black, it is, and here we go. more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. So I absolutely love that. It actually gives me the cold chills. If you guys are here, you'd see they got I got cold chills because um, you know. Uh, and I'll also ask. I'm, I gotta believe everybody knows who that person is. So somebody uh, be the first to guess. Um, but I absolutely love that dealing with mistakes. It's a mindset. So Austin, talk about mistakes. How do you deal with mistakes so that they they don't hold you back? Yeah, I think just accepting that they're part of the game, I think is sort of the first step. I, you know, I'm sure people have heard over and over again, soccer is a game of mistakes. I've had, I've had, you know, every coach that I've ever had tell me that at one point or another. Um, and for me personally, I think something very simple and practical that I, I try to, to use in games and in practice is when I do make a mistake, when I, you know, if I turn the ball over or something along those lines, I try to make sure that my next action is a positive one, no matter how simple. Um, so if I make a mistake, my my next thought is immediately about connecting a pass. It can be a two yard pass, you know, whatever it is. I just want to sort of flush that mistake down the toilet by doing something else that's positive uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so that's kind of how I deal with it in my head. I try not to dwell on it. I just try to move on to the next thing as quickly as I can. Yeah, that's great. Cam, uh, what about yours? How do yeah. you? Well, I, I think one of one of the things for me um, is I like this this one interview that they did of Messi and he, they asked him how many mistakes he makes in a game and he said on a good day probably fifty. So I like I like thinking of that because one of the best players in the world and if not the best makes fifty mistakes in a good game, then me as as a normal human being, I can definitely have room for making mistakes as well. I also seen though that there are differences. There are differences between uh, gender differences between how men deal with some mistakes and how women. Not all men, not all women, but there's kind of a maybe a stereotypical difference between how they deal yeah. with them. What, what's your <laughs> yeah? What's your experience with that? 
That's really true. I think and I actually heard this story from Anson Dorrance, how he, cause he coached both men's and women's soccer. And he said that men are funny because you get them in a room together, the whole team. And you say, this is what's going on. Um, say we're not, we're not passing enough. And all the guys are like, he's not talking about me. And then you get a group of women in there and they're all like, he's talking about me. Every single one of them thinks that he's talking about them making the mistake. So it's um, I think it's, it's, for girls, at least, it's probably more about not taking it so personally, the feedback, but also just in general, when you make a mistake, not not taking it so seriously. And like Austin was saying, just trying to move on and make your next play a good one. Yep. Oh, we have a first question already. Great. Okay. Um, Caroline would like to know if you if you're trying out for a team and you get bumped down to a lower level team within the tryout. Yes, okay. or just after the tryout. Okay. You get moved down to a lower level team. How do you deal with that? Austin, why don't you give that one? Why don't we give that one to you? What are your thoughts? Um, you know, I think it's okay to be disappointed. Um, I think that's the first thing is that a lot of a lot of times people try to tell you, oh, just, you know, you got to move on as quickly as, you know, as quickly as possible. You know, don't don't dwell on it, that kind of thing. I think in those situations, it's okay to be disappointed. Um, like Cam said, we're human beings and, and we're allowed to have emotions about these things. Um, but I think the key is then what, how do you react to that disappointment? Uh, you can blame coaches. You can say the coaches don't know what they're doing, or you can get right to work on improving and making sure that you move up to the team that you want to be on you know, as quickly as possible. And at the next, the next tryout, the next opportunity you get, what have you done to improve yourself between when you were bumped down and, and where you are now? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's okay to be disappointed. It's okay to be upset, but the key is, are, are you sort of living in that disappointment and, and then, you know, blaming others or are you using it, uh, you know, sort of as motivation to improve yourself and, and keep climbing that ladder? Yeah, I'll give I'll give everybody that's listening a, a quick statistic. We've I've studied thousands of players and I know how much they trained when they were young players, D1 players when they were young. And the average, let's just say the average, and of course it's a wide range of ages, but the average is about four times a week, 45 minutes. And that's extra time. That's outside of the club. They're working on the ball, their ball skills are mastering the ball. So let's just say as a high school player, four one hour sessions a week. Uh, as a middle school player, let's just say three one-hour sessions a week on average. Now, if you do that, if you are not at the team level that you want, does everybody have three extra hours as a middle school player a week? You, Everyone does. Every single player has three extra hours. Does everybody have a high school player? Yes, because I know I know they do because when you get to college, preseason or pre-conference in, in most D1 programs spend about 30 to 35 hours with the team. It's a full-time job and they still are able to get their, their work done. So um, anyway, my point is those of you that aren't at the level that you want, take the time and train more to get there the next time. We have another question. Yep. Uh, Zelani wants to know, how do you forget about your nerves, block out the noise and get focused? Cam, I'll take yeah, why don't you one. take that one, Cam? Yeah. I like that question, Zelani. That was a good one. Um, I think for me, getting ready before games is a big, part of when or before tryout or something is a big part of when I I would try to block out the noise and get focused so the first thing I do is listen to music on the way to the game or whatever I'm going to um, listen to really upbeat music that puts me in a good mood and then the next thing that I always do before big moments is I'll, I'll pray and be thankful for the opportunity so I think that if you're remembering that you're just lucky to be in that position because there are so many people out there who would love to be in your shoes, but they're not. And you actually get to live the life and, and play this beautiful game. I think that's really helpful as a way for blocking out all the noise. It's just remembering that um, you should be thankful for even being there. Yeah. That actually brings up the second point, which is on gratitude. Um, there's been a lot of research on gratitude and how it actually calms people that are stressed out by placing your, appreciation outside of yourself, then it relaxes you. And there's a one technique I'd like to give you guys and then I'd like to hear from Austin. How do you 
how do you handle appreciation? How do you use gratitude? Take, when you, just before you take the, the field in training or in a game, walk up to the line and tell yourself, this does not have to be out loud and it can be very private, but tell yourself what you are, why you are appreciative for that moment. What are you appreciative for? It might be your team. It might be your teammate. It might be your grandma, your grandpa. It might be that this beautiful day, whatever it is, appreciate something else other than you and focusing on your game that is proven to relax people. What are your thoughts? Uh, how do you, uh, how do you handle pregame Austin? Uh, pregame is, I think a little bit strange for me because whereas I think a lot of, you know, players will immediately go into like locked in mode, you know, where they, they get very serious and they don't want to talk to anybody and they put their music on and that's it. They're on their own. And, and I'm sort of the opposite. Um, I can't, I can't be in that kind of space. Uh, I, I can't be in my own head for that long. Uh, so I, I try to keep it very loose and, and, you know, make jokes and talk to people and, try to keep other people loose at the same time and just kind of relieve some of that tension that builds uh, in the lead up to a game. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I, I have no idea. It's just- Well, it works for you. That's what's really important right. here is, right. is every every player, every person is a little differently. You found something that works really great for you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, it's, again, it's hard for me to sort of maintain that laser focus, uh, you know, in the build up to a game. So I've found that being loose and and again relieving the tension um works for me because when when we do walk out onto the fields that's when i snap into game mode that's when i know it's time to get back within myself and 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 go about doing my job it sounds like you you take the game very seriously but you don't take yourself very seriously I try not to yeah that's great (laughs) yeah i've got a question for austin um Robert from Virginia wants to know, when you start making many mistakes, how do you not get so tight that you don't continue to make even more mistakes on top of those mistakes you've already made? Particularly, yeah, particularly if you're hearing from the coach, you know, kind of yelling at the top of your, their lungs. Yeah. Again, uh, I'll go back to, to what I said before. It's, it's about breaking that cycle of, you know, compounding mistakes. If you do find yourself making mistake after mistake after mistake, how can you break that up is by doing something very, very simple that you've probably done a million times, but at the end of the day is, is again, still a positive action. So connecting one pass and then boom, that's, that's a clean slate. And, um, but yeah, it's, that's very hard once you get into that, you know, sort of spiral of dwelling on the last mistake. So you're not focused on the next thing that you're doing and you make another one. It's all about just sort of breaking that cycle up and, and pulling yourself out of it. Did you ever play with Jonathan Campbell? I played against him. Uh, okay. I never played with him. Yeah, he was, his was, I asked him the same question. He said, demand the ball, connect the pass. Right. As soon as he makes a mistake, he's, he wants the ball to connect the pass, demand the ball, connect the pass. Yep. A hundred percent. All right. The third thing, uh, happiness. There is a great research project on on happiness that was done at Harvard. And um, we all think this is parents, players, people in business, any profession. Most people think that the route to happiness is achieving. So if I can just make that next team, if I can just earn more playing time, if I can just score that goal or just do something to get that coach's attention, then I'll be happy. The problem with that is is exactly opposite the way the brain works. The way the brain works is in order for you to perform well, you need to be happy, period. You need to be feel good about yourself and then you'll relax and you'll perform well. The problem with it being task focused, if I just do this, if I just do this, if I just do this, you'll never arrive. The goal posts will always get pushed out and you'll never be happy. You'll never be satisfied. You'll never feel good about yourself. So being happy going into a game, being happy going into a training session will help you perform much more effectively. Cam, how do you handle how do you handle that? How do you get into a routine where you are upbeat and happy? I going back to the music thing I was mentioning earlier to Zelani's question. I try to everything I do on a game day before the game, I try to make it 
something that I'm enjoying and having a good time. So limiting my stress on a game day. So I'll wake up, have breakfast, something that, that I like, you know, I'll listen to upbeat music before the game um, and just trying to limit any negativity on that day. Because if I'm already in a good mood going into the game, it's going to be easier for me to um, feel like playing and, and be happy already. And just maintaining that has to do with not taking everything so seriously. Yeah, it's great. So both you guys, both uh, Austin, both you and Cam are saying somewhat similar. Just don't take it too seriously. You can take the game seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think and a, a huge thing for me on this too is um, having things outside of soccer that make you happy. Um, and this was something I figured out, I think, way too late in my career. Um, but when when I have just soccer going on and when, when it's just soccer and I'm only focused on soccer, if soccer doesn't go well, then that's it. That's, you know, my, my anxiety goes through the roof. My happiness goes through the floor. And, and again, it's hard to pull yourself out of that. So having other things to lift you up, I think is, is hugely important because if you get locked in on one thing and that one thing doesn't go well, then that brings everything else down. Yeah. We have another question for Austin. Caroline wants to know, what do you do when your team is losing? Everybody's mad and you're just not clicking as a team. That's a good question. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess. You've, you're a veteran. You've been there a long time. So you've had to have had some situations where, you know, the, the people just, they're just not getting along well because of the current, performance. Absolutely. Yeah. It happens all the time. It, and, and I'm not sure I have the right answer to it still, you know, 10 years into doing this. Um, but my, I guess my, in my role as a leader, it's my job to, to pull people together and try to somehow, you know, remind people that we're on the same team and we're all, we all need to be pulling in the same direction to achieve whatever we're trying to achieve. Um, that's, much easier said than done. I think when you have a group of uh, willful young men uh, or women, uh, it, it can be very difficult to do, but just, yeah, just finding a way to communicate with people. Um, everybody hears things uh, in different ways. So you may need to vary the way that you speak to people or the message that you're giving people. It's not going to be the same for every player. So I think that's a big part of, of leading and, and trying to get people back on track is meeting some people where they're at or, you know, giving somebody a kick in the ass, whether it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, some yeah. people need one, some people need the other. Um, so figuring that out, I think is, is huge. Yeah. That, that emotional intelligence, that's, that's just tough because it's, it's pretty rare for people yeah. to know how to see and read a situation and how to treat people. Yep. Very good. And as a teacher or as a distractor, <laughs> you've learned, you've probably learned that over a long period of time. Definitely. All right. I got, uh, I have one more, the fourth, and then we're going to go back to you, Austin, on, uh, on, uh, on the fifth topic. So the fourth is to, to, uh, and this kind of came out both in Cam's discussion, Cam's uh, techniques and Austin's techniques is to focus externally, focus outside of yourself. And I like to use the, is it an analogy, a simile? What's the, when you hold the rope? Is that an analogy? A metaphor. A metaphor. All right. I have to ask these these more educated people than me. Yeah, 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 we Austin, need the English Austin, teacher. Austin, yeah, Austin, 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 a metaphor. Okay, so the metaphor is you're holding a rope. And at the end of the, so it's, oh, it's, it's uh, the rope is over, hanging over a thousand foot cliff. And at the other end of it is your favorite soccer ball. All right. Not a lot of risk. You can easily pull it up. But what if it's a 100 pound bag of sand? Okay. That's going to be hard to hold. And what would you do if it's a hundred pound bag of sand? Most people are going to say, I can't get this thing up. So they're going to let it go. Well, what if it's your teammate, <laughs> your favorite teammate, same, same weight, most likely you're going to hold that rope and pull it up with everything you've got in your soul, your heart and soul and your body and your mind to bring that person to safety. Your hands are going to be blistered. You're going to be sweating. You're going to be giving everything you've got. That is a mentality in a big game. You In a big game or a tryout, you're given everything you've got. So at the end of the day, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm good because I gave it all 
I have, and that's called holding the rope. It focuses on something other than you. You are trying to help your teammates with everything you've got. You leave nothing on the field. That's a, a mentality, and everybody can make that decision. If you go in light, you're leaving a lot on the field. If you go in and and with that mentality, you can be you can rest assured. You can re- look yourself in the eye, look yourself in the mirror, and say, "I gave it all." Regardless of the outcome, it doesn't matter because I gave it my gave it my all. Cam, what are your thoughts on that? I totally agree with that. Ever since I first started playing soccer, we got a poster of Vince Lombardi, a really famous um, former football coach, and one of my favorite quotes on the poster is, um, "Well, I don't know exactly how it goes, but basically, it's about leaving everything on yeah. the field, yeah. and that if you've done that." even if you didn't win, you still won inside of you. And I think that's really important, especially if like one of the questions, the team's not having a good game or even you're not having a good game. I always felt worse about my performance if I didn't put the effort in than if I didn't score a goal or if I didn't have um, the best performance in general. Yes. We have a question from Libby and we'll, we can direct this to Austin. Austin if Libby is trying to move up a team, should she let the coaches know? Uh, sure. I think it never hurts to make clear your ambitions to your coaches. Um, I think it's all about framing that conversation in the proper way. So you don't want to approach your coaches and say, I think I should be on the higher team. Uh, you know, that's not a conversation that's probably going to go very well, yeah. um, but, but going to them and saying, you know, I have this ambition of, of making the team above ours. What can I do to make that ambition a reality? I think that is a hundred percent. Okay. And, 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 uh, hopefully your, your coaches will give you the feedback that you need to, to make that jump. And you, and I would recommend, uh, Austin, I would recommend, and by the way, Cam just had to leave for she had to leave for practice. That's why the, the chair is empty now. But um, the uh, you'd want to do that not at the tryouts. You'd want to do that, um, you know, before. I would guess you'd want to do that before the tryouts, so they yeah. know. Yeah, definitely in advance, so that you have time to to work on the things that they tell you you need to work on. And yeah, um, but I think that's great. I think that's taking ownership of your own trajectory and and you know taking accountability for your own progression. It's great. Any other questions? So I'm going to go, uh, Austin, you, uh, you had a fifth, any particular things that worked for you to, um, get through nerves performing great on the big day, the tryout day or the big game? Yeah. I think one thing that I've developed over the last couple of years, um, I've, you know, sort of implemented a, a daily meditation practice, um, uh, you know, mindfulness, me- mindfulness meditation for 15, 20 minutes a day. Um, and I find that to be effective with nerves because I think there's this perception of nerves that, you know, you should ignore them, but I, I don't think that ignoring them accomplishes anything because you're never going to be able to put them outside of your head. I think that's probably impossible, but what, you know, meditation has allowed me to do is see, see the reason for my nerves more clearly and when you see things more clearly, usually that sort of takes away a little bit of their power. Um, so if I'm able to see why I'm nervous, then I can start to sort of interrogate, uh, you know, those reasons and, and sort of, you know, give my own rebuttal to my own mind. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's been very useful to me is just, you know, sitting down 15, 20 minutes a day, watching my breath go in, you know, go out. And then when, when a thought pops into my head, when nerves, you know, bubble up, I can see them more clearly and I can say, okay, this is, these are nerves. Why, why am I thinking this? Where did this come from? And that sort of takes the edge off. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. I don't think you can ever just get rid of nerves completely, but it's uh, sort of a marginal gain that I think in the end can be helpful. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Let me let me add. Uh, some we have a we have a comment to Austin. Yeah. Ava from Virginia says, "Will you please come back to the January bash, Austin? I, 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 I need to someone answer. to nutmeg." I refuse to answer any of Ava's questions. I yeah. want to, <laughs> I want her blocked. <laughs> she wants to be the newest panic queen. She tells Cameron to step aside. 
So, so now that uh, now that Cam is out of the room, Austin, tell us about this pan. I have one more uh, a bonus tip, but I want to talk about this Pana challenge that you and Cam are involved in. It was great. It was great. We needed to go to video review to see to see Cam's Meg, but uh, no, it was awesome. Obviously, I'm very uh, I'm okay with being Meg by Cam. She's an incredibly skillful player. Um, so I got a, I got a couple uh, around her, but I didn't get get through. So next well, time. You did a you did an elastico, and I'll I'll share this by the way the people that are listening to this I will share this with you guys uh, this video he's uh, Austin again just a great human being enjoys the the pure fun of it and he had an, uh, a brilliant elastico that almost megged her got around her instead and then he flipped the ball up in the air and did a step over and got by her twi you know twice so anyway I will share that with you guys so we're gonna do a rematch Austin we're gonna do a rematch hopefully sometime uh, late spring early early summer. Let's do and, it. Uh, you'll have a heads up. So, uh, can we come summer? yeah, yeah. Can we come summer? Yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on the dates there. Okay, so let me give you guys um, one more thing, um, a, a technique that's really important. Uh, sometimes parents, sometimes players uh, go into a, they go into a tryout thinking that it's unfair. Okay, so if you have that, and I know this happens a lot of times because you're you're trying to get to a new team. And you look and you say, I'm better than this player. I should be able to make this team. What you have to realize about coaches is they are trying to solve a puzzle. And they have 15, 20, 22 players that they're trying to fit together. You may be a better player than some of their players that are on the team, but they may also be stacked in those positions and they need somebody else to fill it in. So it's better for you not to go in with this mindset that it's unfair, it's rigged, um, there's no chance I can be, I can ever be chosen. Just go into it that it is actually completely fair. And the reason I say that, even frankly, even if it isn't, it you will go in feeling better, and you will play better, and you will enjoy it more. It's just as it's another kind of a mindset thing that is important for you guys. What are your thoughts, uh, Austin? No, yeah, I think that's great. I think um, you know, in the, in the pro game, uh, we have you know 20, 20, 20 some odd players on the roster and only 18 get to dress on game day. Um, so when we have, you know, games, obviously there's five or six players that, that aren't going to be involved on game day and they get very upset about that. And they come to me and they say, Oh, you know, why am I not in the 18? What, you know, what, what is this all about? I'm better than so-and-so or I'm, you know, I'm more talented than so-and-so. And my answer is always the same. It's, it's not the 18 best players. It's the 18 most useful players. Yeah. So, what can you do to make yourself more useful? You know, can you play a different position? Can you play multiple positions? Can you strike the ball with both feet? Are you, you know, important on set pieces? You know, how many elements of your game can you bring up to a level to where now it's almost impossible to keep you out of the squad or off the field? Yeah. Um, so it's not, you know, the, the whole fairness thing, I think, is uh, sort of, a you know, going down a rabbit hole that you don't want to go down. Um, yeah, it's to, there's a couple of reasons. One is you can't control it. Um, it makes you feel bad and you will invariably underperform if you have those feelings. So it, uh, Austin brings up a great point. I want to make sure everybody understands. A lot of these solutions go back to the individual personal responsibility that you actually have a lot more control over your results than you think. Everybody thinks it's all up to the coach. Well, in reality, it's 99% of it is up to you what you decide to do with what happens to you. You decide to reinvent yourself. You decide to master a new set of skills. You decide to work harder than anybody else around you. Be like Ronaldo when he was taught as a, one of his coaches when he was 14 years old said, your path to your potential is to look around at every player that you see and work harder than every one of them. And that simple thing is what got Ronaldo. Of course, he's got lots of capabilities, but um, that got him to never, ever stop training. Uh, we have a question from Andrea. She has got a very good question that most of the kids out there have dealt with. Yeah. How do you handle tryouts when most of the players know each other? They pass and talk to each other and pretty much ignore you. What can you do to show your abilities in those circumstances? That's an interesting one, uh, Austin. I'm, I'm going to have you answer that one. Um, yeah, I think, again, it goes back to c controlling what you can control. Um, you can't control 
anyone else and what they're doing or saying or how they're acting. Um, and I think that the tendency is for kids to try really, really hard to stand out and that forces them to try to do things that maybe they're not capable of, do of doing or they're not comfortable doing, which inevitably leads to, uh, you know, failure during the tryout at some point. So I always tell kids at tryouts, don't try to stand out. Just, just play the way that you've played every other day of your life. Yeah. Um, because ultimately I think when you're most comfortable is when you're most successful, you know, in those situations. Um, the second that you tr start trying to do things that, that you're not comfortable doing, um, again, it starts that spiral of, of mistakes and it, it's hard to, hard to pull yourself out. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, what about using voice? What do you mean by voice? In tryouts, if you're being ignored, oh, okay. how how successful would you be using voice? She, you're saying your comment is to be calling more for to, the ball. Yeah, yeah, calling for the ball, be more demanding on the ball. Yeah, I think that's something that all coaches like to see from their players is the willingness yeah. to demand the ball and and to be a leader and to be vocal. Um, yeah. So that's never a bad thing as long as it's in a in a positive way and and not. Uh, you know, you're not insulting anybody <laughs> and you're, and you're getting into a position where it's, you know, it's helpful. You're not, you're not just constantly calling for the ball. You can sometimes people chatter constantly calling for the ball, but be in a positive position, right. um, you know, to get the ball. Yeah. yeah. And coaches will see that by the way, guys, if, if, if you are a player that's constantly getting in a good position for the team and you're not getting the ball, but you're being vocal, they're just not giving you the ball. They will see that you are in the right position and you're, these players are just not giving you the ball. That you will not get penalized for people who are playing poor passes. All right, you will actually look much better than they do. Okay, so um, I want to add for the untrained. So there is uh, the untrained. I'm going to spend just a few minutes showing you a uh, a kind of a new tool. This is for those out uh, those those people out there that are are um, interested in learning to train on their own. This is a, Austin, this is the tool that I uh, mentioned before. Uh, give me a one second here. Duplicate deck. There we go. Uh, this is, uh, actually this player was on the uh, a call a few minutes ago. This is Zelani and we're using her account. So this is, uh, this is uh, Zelani's personal player development portal. And what we manage in it is hours, training hours. We manage skills, skill development, and we manage grit. So for those players that are, don't feel like they are at the, um, at the level that they want to be, this kind of an approach of measurement based training could be very interesting for you. She sees on her, her, her homepage, that her training hours, her goal is 2.5 hours. This last week, she trained four and a half hours, a team goal. She's, this is her full team on uh, Baltimore Celtic as a 2.75 hour uh, goal. And she's got time left to train about one month, two days. And she has trained so far 63 hours. So here's what I love about uh, Zelani is her hours that she trains also it's translates to her skill development. So this is just an interesting chart that you can see her goal here in black is two and a half hours a week. She's constantly tr training over her goal. So you can see over here the cumulative hours that she trains. And then you can take a look at her skills. And I'm going to run through this quickly. So it's going to be a little bit um, a kind of a drinking through a fire hose. But uh, she tests on day one. She tests uh, on, on the midway through the training. And then at the end, we don't know what her scores are, but we give her three skills to test on. She scores herself. And then we tell her what her team rank is, what stage of development she is. These are her videos that she makes. And then down here, we show her what do the stages look like? So her goal, this is really cool because we just launched this platform to, um, the Baltimore Celtic group and also four other teams on the uh, in the around the US. And uh, I talked to her dad today. And he said, this is making her want to train more. And I said, why? Because she's a stage two player right here. We know her scores. We know they've been validated. She's a stage two player. And she wants to become a stage two over the next five weeks. That's what we want for you guys is the ability to track your development, measure your development, make it fun, but also see what these different levels 
look like. So, and then the last one is that we like to track for the kids is grit. This is just a chart of uh, her as, as her um, development grows, her grit grows and grit is just completion of tasks. So all these tools, these aren't the training tools themselves, but it, it's a look at the, at her training and her getting better and, and how the kids get better. So um, Austin, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on measurement based training? She's 10 and she's absolutely killing it. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's great. I think anytime that you can see, you know, I, I think I'm a visual person and anytime you can have that affirmation of, of your own progress and, and of the, of the things that you're completing, I think that's only going to add to your confidence and, and being able to say, you know, if nerves do come up and you can pull up your phone and, and say, look how prepared I am, that, that can go a long way to, to sort of diminishing those nerves. Um, that's actually a really, I, I honestly hadn't thought about that. That's a very interesting thought. All right. Yeah, so I, th I th it's something I think we've all been conditioned to respond to things like this because of the world that we live in. But anytime that you can look and see your progress and and prove to yourself that you are progressing and that you're preparing, um, that's only going to serve you well, I think. Yeah, improve your confidence. Any other questions? Because I want to end on something that makes me happy. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Okay. Do you have any? Um, I am right now sending a message to Kelly. Um, yes, we have a okay. special guest who's been trying to get in the door ever since we started. Oh, can you hear yes. him out there? Yes, Why don't you him. let him in? That, him. You go ahead. That'll let him. That's our relaxation. Come on. All right. He's been kid. whining. He's been whining. He's been whining. I so, locked mine out too. So yeah, yeah. Wait, do you have a dog? I do. Yeah. All right. So he's been whining uh, so. the, the entire time we're in here. Okay. So let me uh, let me tell you guys really quickly what does make me happy. I'm going to show you something here. Let me do a screen share, and then let everybody get to their training. Okay, so we in North Carolina, we had uh, we had a snowstorm today, which is crazy this time of year in North Carolina. We don't get it. So uh, I ran out, grabbed my drone, and this is our R and D field. So by the way, our you can see this little stairway to the top of the wall. There's a video platform here. For those of you guys that have not been out here before, you'll see a couple other video platforms here. This is where we make all our video recordings. That makes me happy. <laughs> Snow in April makes you happy? Well, just see, it's the any <laughs> soccer field just is, uh, is yeah, it's just beautiful. All right. So, uh, Austin, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Just, I mean, just, uh, I mentioned this to Austin, by the way, that we're doing this. And, and uh, he instantly said, I would, I would love to help the kids. So um, just again, really appreciate you as a human being, really appreciate you as a player, as a coach. And I will side with Ava, come back. And uh, we want you to be a trainer again. He came back to our January Bash this year as a speaker, great speaker as well, but we really appreciate you. And uh, thank you for so much for doing this. No, it's my pleasure. I love, uh, love being involved with the Captain Elite community and, and hearing from all these kids that I've gotten to know so well. And I'm glad that they're all still on board and still training hard. Great. And by the way, um, guys, if you have other ideas, other topics that you want to us to cover and you want Austin to come back and cover, list them, list them, you know, just, uh, just tell us, uh, this guy is not going to leave me alone now. He's going to, he wants to, he wants to go outside. Um, list them. If you have any topics, I heard, um, Collier Owen sent me a note and said, uh, what pregame meals and postgame meals, how do you prepare you know, nutrition, which is amazing. Cause I think he's a young, a relatively young player and he's already thinking that so if you have any other ideas if you, any other ideas we're all uh we'd love to love to talk about it. all right guys have a great uh evening and again austin thank you very much thank you all right take care